Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Almost Dropouts podcast. I'm your host, Davik, and today I have Mylene on the podcast. Mylene, you want to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. It's nice to be here, and thank you so much, Davik, for, for having me. Yeah, really gl- glad to have you here. Uh, and yeah, just to give you a little bit of background on Mylene. So she's currently a URLU student in management engineering, and she's doing an associate product management internship at WISH. But aside from that, she's been part of the first cohort of the League of Innovators. Uh, and in 2018 was named as in the top 25 women of influence. She was also named ADECO. Am I saying that right? ADECO? Yep, that's right. Perfect. ADECO's 2021 Canadian CEO for one month. And for the last couple of years, uh, she's working in Lumaki Labs. And actually, that's that's where I got to meet Mylene uh, through her work at Lumaki Labs. And most recently, she's working on a new Web3 project. So lots of interesting stuff that you've done and you're doing. So really, really happy to have you on the podcast. And I'd love to get into it. For sure. Super excited. Perfect. So let's talk about your story first. So uh, you're into entrepreneurship. So what was some of the pivotal points that got you into it? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was thinking about this and I think more so than a pivotal point, I think it was more so a mindset shift that I had. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I always knew that I wanted to make an impact. Like when I think about high school, I would always like write down ideas or things like that in my notebook. Um, But the missing link there was like, okay, how do I actually action that now? Like, what is it that I can do right now? And I think for me, what really shifted um, that perception of like, you know, I have to wait until I'm older to to jump into something or to do something uh, was failing in first year. I think a lot of us in engineering have probably faced that where it's the first time that you face failure in your life. And so for me, I was on academic probation. I was um, pretty much failing all my classes at the time. And mm-hmm. I kind of had to decide what it is I wanted to do. You know, was I going to let this take me down and kind of boggle my mood or whatever or was I going to keep going and moving forward and I obviously chose the latter path and through that experience I feel like I realized that um, you know my perception of fear or risk had changed a lot and so that's when I decided Mm -hmm. to start to act on my ideas more because I realized that failure wasn't a bad thing necessarily Um, so that realization actually led me to create my first venture Uh, it's actually a social enterprise that was called Fem and STEM And so I actually worked on a lot of workshops and partnerships and things like that to inspire other women in STEM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's funny because I I know like how you mentioned in first year how you were how you've ended up failing. So the name (laughs) the almost dropouts actually comes from my experience in the first couple of years of my degree, because luckily, you know, I didn't have to go through the whole process. Like I I didn't end up failing, but I was very, very, very close. So <laughs> definitely, I got like a crazy reality check. And that's honestly a lot of why I started doing uh, like all this content outside. Mm-hmm. Because what I realized is for a long time, my my identity was tied to like getting marks. And, and I don't know, it was just tied to academics. But I think I was really in for a rude realization in, in, in first year. And so that's why I ended up starting more, more different content there. So it's, it's really interesting to see that parallel. Yeah. And I honestly think that like a lot of those challenges that we face, especially in this period of our life where things are so volatile, like it really does shift the way that you think and the way that you act on things moving forward. For sure. So yeah. So you started Fem and STEM, really, really cool initiative. So what were some of the stuff you did in Fem and STEM? Yeah. So I was actually on my first co-op in the time at the time. So I was living in Toronto. So I did a lot of workshops and partnerships with other STEM organizations um, to raise awareness about like, I guess, for one, my story in STEM and some of the challenges that I faced. And two, you know, just talking about how women can actually break into STEM and sort of what that looks like. So bringing in guest speakers to understand what is a career path in STEM look like. Uh, We launched a Catalyst program in partnership with RBC in 2018. um, And that had a lot of like mentorship. So we matched up, I think it was around 20 women with uh, mentors at RBC. And so we did a lot of those kinds of things, hackathons, just like a whole array of um, STEM activities, which was really fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting. So uh, so you worked on this Fab and STEM first, and then you ended up working at Lumaki Lab. So, or you're working on Lumaki Lab, sorry. So what, what ended up moving you towards Lumaki Labs? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And like, I feel like this is something that I never really addressed, um, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's fun to talk about it here now, I guess. I think that Lumaki Labs had a bit of a weird journey. So it actually started off as me trying to shift some of my work in feminine STEM into a broader audience. So right. what a lot of people don't know is that Lumaki Labs actually started off um, as an extension of feminine STEM. It kind of started off as more of a in a way, you could say like a consulting agency where we tried to help people run um, recruitment events or like host workshops to um, educate like broader audiences about STEM and things like that. Uh, we didn't really do too, too much with that uh, before COVID hit. Uh, and then when COVID hit, that's actually when things started to shift into what people know of Lumaki Labs now, which is essentially, um, you know, a remote internship onboarding platform. So mm -hmm. when COVID hit and things like that, uh, we shifted our mission to help companies unlock early talent through remote internships. Uh, and that's when we really started to go into the B2B SaaS space. Right. Wow. Okay. So yeah, I never knew that. So that's yeah. really interesting. You started, you started in Femin STEM, then actually started shifting that to Lamaki Labs and completely pivoted in the middle there, or not completely, but somewhat pivoted there. Uh, so that, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting. So, so, so when, when you guys, you know, went through that pivot what were some of the what were some of the ideas there what were some of the challenges there yeah i mean there was a lot of different ideas floating around i think the main thing at the top of mind for us was uh with all the changes happening due to covid like it was a very hectic time for everyone and so we were trying to think like mm -hmm. what can we do to add value in this space and for us i think you know being students uh, we're very and especially being at waterloo where we have exposure to a lot of co-ops we started to think about like okay um, you know, remote internships are now a norm. Is there anything that we can do there? And so that kind of led into into uh, what Luma, what sorry, <laughs> no what Lumaki is now. So uh, mm -hmm. it kind of bounced around the idea of being like a recruitment platform as well as like an onboarding platform. Uh, and originally, we did want it to be a two in one platform, but you know, since we're a small team, we decided to start off with the onboarding. Uh, so it's kind of how things started there, but I think I derailed from your original question, so feel free to give me a refresher. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, no worries. Uh, it was just, yeah, that, that that sort of hit on the head, sort of just getting your thoughts on that pivot and and where that sort of stemmed from. And I think, like for myself, like I I definitely see a big difference between you know in person internships and remote internships. Mm -hmm. And the biggest one of the biggest issues I see is with the onboarding process because when you're in person, it's it's more structured out and in general it's a lot easier to associate different items because you have a face to associate it with them um and you do that online too like you have zoom meetings but it's not the same as being in a physical space um so it's interesting to see like what the work you guys did at lumaki lab so at least try to make that onboarding process a little bit easier and i think definitely uh now and, and at the time especially like it's a uh, it was definitely valuable yeah, for sure. And I re remember the first part of your question now about like some of the challenges. I think the biggest challenge was probably like, again, adapting to to being remote ourselves. I think um, at the time, too, we were trying to grow out the team a little bit more and try to figure that out. But, um, you know, since switching into the B2B SaaS space was so drastically different from what we were originally doing, um, I think it was a little bit tough there of just like getting everyone on the same page and trying to, to navigate that. But that was one of the main challenges that came to mind there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so you guys you know you guys come up with this idea so what was some of the how do you guys go about developing those relationships with companies so they'll have like take on this onboarding process mm -hmm. so i think you know the main thing there was really just understanding you know what some of the pain points companies were facing were uh right. honestly speaking like reflecting back we weren't the best at that at the time um like we did have to make a lot of product pivots and to be completely transparent uh we actually are looking to start ramping things down this year with lumaki labs just because the market mm -hmm. timing even though it sounds really good you know you think that it's like uh, remote internships like now is the right time but because we're still living in this era of the pandemic and because things are still changing um frequently a lot of companies don't have you know remote intern onboarding as a top priority right, right now which like isn't a bad thing to say on those companies like it's fair that you know you want to prioritize your full-time employees and their well-being first um but i think we found some challenges there with that but right. i guess you know for us when we were getting started in this space 
what really helped us was trying to look at the resources around us. So we did get in touch with a lot of like regional innovation centers, student clubs, uh, accelerator programs and things like that. So um, that was good, at least in helping us, you know, gain visibility and sort of grow our network. So in the time that we were, um, you know, really, really going full steam ahead on Lumaki Loves, um, we, we did get to pilot. And so far, I think had around like, almost about 500 users on our platform. So at least we mm -hmm. kind of went through that milestone. Right. Oh, that, that's really impressive. And I think, it, you know, even with pivoting, I think any any good startup has to be ready to pivot. Uh, and I mean, it's remote internships weren't as common before the pandemic. So uh, even though you guys had to figure out, figure stuff out, I'm sure companies also have to figure out what they want to do for their remote yeah. internships onboarding. So that's sort of like a natural progression where you're going to have to pivot according to them. Uh, and, and, and stuff you learn as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's unfortunate here you guys are wrapping down Lumaki Labs, but I guess on to bigger and better things. I'm sure uh, I'm sure you and the founders will go on to do some really great other projects. Yeah, 100%. And I think like this was a really great learning experience for us, uh, mm -hmm. just because, you know, it gives you a sense of what it's like to to take an idea and really put it out there. And, you know, a lot of the connections that we made through the Founder Institute or, uh, you know, through Velocity or uh, other programs like that are things that will stick with us. So when we do come up with other ideas in the future, at least we know that we have uh, those people in our circle. Mm -hmm. And and I think Lumaki Labs is really great for, you know, getting you on the map, getting you those connections, getting you uh, <laughs> some really interesting people to talk with. So, uh, you know, it was, it was, I think it was very well worth. Um, but let's talk about your new project then. So I know you, I, I know I mentioned at the beginning that you're working on a new Web3 project. So uh, do you want to share some stuff about that? Yeah, for sure. So it is very new. Um, and I am also very new to Web3. Mm -hmm. uh, I only started really working on this project less than a month ago now. So really at the start of January. Um, and basically the project that I'm working on right now is called Trailblaze Tribe. And it's volume one of a collection of around 7,000 or 8,000 NFTs, still mm -hmm. deciding on the final number. Uh, but essentially it's a profile picture or a PFP collection. Uh, and it's meant to empower and unite women in STEM. So mm -hmm. I will pause there and see if you have any specific questions because this is like a whole whole other like topic and there's a lot that I can say. <laughs> For sure, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, totally cool to be new to Web3. I'm pretty sure most people are. Um, so that's totally cool. Um, and yeah, I, I know like, so specifically for PFP, are you talking about like, I know Twitter uh, recently changed their profile picture so you can put NFTs uh, as your profile picture. Is that sort of where, where you're looking at or? Yeah, so in the NFT space, there's a lot of different types of collections out there. There's photography collections, there's pure artwork. Uh, there's a lot of like metaverse focused collections um, and a huge one right now is um, PFP. So profile picture collections. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess depending on the founder, you know, with your collection, your NFTs can also have a different type of utility. So like even though, you know, one use of it is the, the profile picture, uh, a lot of talk right now is, you know, what is the value of an NFT and how do you kind of justify that? You know, a lot of people who are new to the space are unaware about like what's going on in the nft space might see it as just like a jpeg that you can save um but i think utilities and kind of coming up with that roadmap really changes things in that sense right right okay makes sense yeah so so and, and then you mentioned so specifically the focus on this volume one collection is for women in stem so what was yeah. sort of the thought process i know i know of course you're a woman in stem and, <laughs> and especially with the work you've done in femi stem makes sense but what was sort of the thought process there and when you're creating the collection curating the collection and then the purpose of the collection as well as a, as a broader broader whole yeah that's a good question so i think for me it also ties into like why i started entering the web3 space in general um, so, you know, especially because we just finished the end of 2021, I had a lot of time to reflect on, honestly, the past few years of my life in entrepreneurship and in school in general. And I started to reflect on my experiences with Fem and STEM and Lumaki Labs. And I started to pick out the elements that I loved or that I didn't love so much. And what I realized was that the Web3 space and specifically NFTs presented this really cool opportunity to pull together the aspects that I love. You know, it had the element of community driven uh, work. It had the, uh, the sorry, it had the element of art. Uh, so 
something that a lot of people don't typically see about me on like LinkedIn or whatever is that I really like creating art and I've done so since I was since I was a really young kid. Um, And it also combines like the tech and the entrepreneurial vision. Um, So, you know, all that being kept in mind, uh, a lot of the stuff that I do is rooted in social impact. And for me, when I Mm -hmm. think back to the impact and experiences that I had with Fem and STEM, I actually really missed being able to inspire and kind of help other young women through their journey. And so uh, a part of it was trying to bring that back with this collection uh, and try to make it even bigger, you know, try to do even bigger things with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. I think um, it's just been interesting to see how NFTs have allowed a lot of people to pursue. I mean, of of course there's artists who are, who are really big and they can make NFTs, but um, but I think it's also been interesting to see how NFTs have really allowed digital artists or artists in general to pursue uh, art as 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 a career path and or or even as a hobby. So uh, it's interesting to see that that collection there. Um, and and then yeah. on top of that, like your experiences in Fem and STEM, putting that together with that you know with with your passion for art, it, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, and I guess like to your point too, what you were saying earlier um, about like artists and things like that, I think it's such an interesting space right now too, because, um, you know, even though I've only been in this community really actively engaging for less than a month, I've been able to talk to so many amazing creators in this space and artists who um, have such beautiful artwork or photography, but didn't really get a lot of attention beforehand. Um, right. But now they're, you know, selling out their collections, they're getting this visibility, and all of it is community driven. And I think that's one of the things that I, I love about this space so far is, um, you know, I don't want to say it's not like the startup world in a sense that like, uh, there are a lot of parallels. But I think the community is a little bit different. I feel like with startups, it's a little bit more siloed in a sense that, um, you know, you're very focused on your own business and your venture. Um, yeah. But in the NFT space, like everyone's there trying to to uplift each other. Everyone's sharing each other's artwork and um, right. Twitter spaces are a huge thing now. So people are always on those just trying to share each other's stories. Right. Yeah, I think with a startup, it's, it's usually pretty directed. Like, okay, this is our product yeah. market fit. Uh, we're gonna, this is how we're going to achieve product market fit. And you just have a roadmap. Well, in this, because nobody like honestly, it's such a new field. So everybody's sort of trying to figure it out, trying to figure out what people like and and how to curate their art. It's a lot more, I guess, creative. Is that the right way to say it? Or yeah, it's like a it's like an open creative sort of process. Like I feel like because it's so community driven, um, it's not just like you and your team or you and your like immediate users isolated and trying to figure out the next steps. It's like things are very free form in a sense like there actually are roadmaps in the nft space because usually when you start building a collection you kind of um showcase what your roadmap is uh so kind of outlining the utility of your nft and so when people buy into your project or buy your nfts uh when they become a holder they you know kind of see the value based on like the milestones that you have on your roadmap um right but you know i think it's I kind of like lost my train of thought there and kind of digress from where we were, where we were going. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. Um, yeah, but basically, basically I was just trying to understand like, you know, just sort of uh, how the creative space is. So you mentioned there the roadmap. Yeah. Um, and then I, I guess I, as a quick follow-up, I guess. So f- for this mm-hmm. collection, your first V1 collection, or just in general for Trailblaze, Trail, sorry, Trailblaze Tribe in general, uh, is there like a certain aim you have for this collection to achieve or is it just more of a creative uh, undergoing for you? Yeah, so I'm still currently working out the logistics of my roadmap, but mm-hmm. at a high level, like the mission behind this collection is really to help individuals reach their full potential and basically trailblaze their own paths. Um, so like I was saying before, I really like how this space is super community driven. So for me, I really want to curate a strong community of people who want to uplift each other uh, and help each other. You know, a lot of these NFT collections um, are driven by the power of their communities. And so just being right. able to bring together these women and kind of onboard more women into the Web3 space uh, would be really interesting. I think it really creates this global mindset and so for me, 
I'm looking forward to that um, mm. aspect. And I guess in terms of like my roadmap, there's a few different things that I'm brainstorming right now. Um, there's different things like mentorship hubs that I'm thinking of. So like, for example, holders can get access to an, exclu an exclusive mentorship hub or like office hours with um, notable women in STEM. Uh, there's other things that are a little bit smaller, like, for example, highlighting the stories of other women in STEM as part as being a holder. Um, and a huge part of what I actually want to do with my project, which I can't believe I almost forgot. This is like one of the main reasons that I got into this space as well, okay. um, is the ability to like take some of the proceeds and then donate them. Right. Um, so the great thing about like everything being community driven is uh, you can also have your community vote on different uh charitable organizations. So a big part of that for me is like uh, allowing developing countries to get more access to STEM education. So I do want to mm -hmm. donate uh, a portion of my proceeds towards that as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of uh, a scattered mind dump. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's interesting. It's sort of like, I, and, I, and I think this is one of the things NFTs, right? I think a lot of people just look at the artwork and mm -hmm. they think that's the whole value of it, which to be fair, a lot of it's for a lot of NFTs that is, but I think what I'm starting to see with a lot of NFTs uh, is it's sort of like a membership token in a way. It's sort of like, mm -hmm. yes, you have an NFT that's yours, but it also has this offering behind the art itself. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the value is going to be driven uh, because I, I think for like the actual digital artwork, I'm not sure how, like, I, I really don't know how sustainable that is or how long that's going to last for. I, I, honestly, it might last for, like, I, I don't know. I'm very confused about that part. <laughs> uh, but the actual offering behind it, I think that's what's really interesting. And I think when you look at a lot of Web3 technologies, like you mentioned, a lot of them are behind, a lot of the technologies have this community aspect behind them. Um, I know like, uh, obviously NFTs, like you mentioned here is, is one of the new things with memberships. And I know DAOs are an example for that. Yeah. Uh, I've done a little bit of research on that. So, uh, I think that community is what's really going to be the value of web three or, or NFTs in general, but I'm not sure it's, it's interesting. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. I think the community in itself, like you said, can lead to so many other things like DAOs and, um, just other initiatives. Uh, and I, I also do agree with you to some extent about like what you mentioned about how like just the art might not always be enough. Like I think it is in some cases, especially for like those who um, are artists and like kind of have done that for for a living and things like that. Uh, but I think as the market gets more saturated with different NFT projects, like utility is increasingly important now, you know, mm -hmm. holders understanding the value that they can get from the NFT or even just like the type of community that they're going to be in. So I think you raise a good point there. Yeah, for sure. And I think, I think, and, and this is the thing, like it's, it's really hard to sort of tell <laughs> what, what's going yeah. to be the, <laughs> be the value, but you might as well try something and see, see how it works. Right. And I think that's, that's the whole point of, of doing a startup. That's the whole point of innovation. Uh, it's just trying something and seeing if it works. So I think well, a lot of people right now don't necessarily see the value in NFTs. And honestly, I, sometimes I, I struggle with it as well. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like we have to try different things and seeing the seeing uh, where it can be applied. And I think it's really interesting, actually, sort of I'll sort of a tangent to that. But in, in this case, like usually in product management, you have a problem space and a solution space, right? So mm -hmm. the problem space usually dictates what the solution space looks like because you have a problem and you come up with a solution. But in this case, I think Web3, NFTs, and everything in general, it's like we have a solution space, but we're trying to find different problems to put it in. Um, and I think a lot of people, like I, I think a lot of people aren't giving the respect it deserves or could potentially deserve because it's really hard to think from that perspective. It is. Uh, it is very hard. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like I'm sure you know all about that, of course, doing this. So it's just really interesting to think about. But yeah, I'd love to see your thoughts about that. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And I think honestly, a lot of a lot of people's thoughts on Web3 as well are around, you know, how can we improve the flaws in Web2? So Web2 mm -hmm. solved a lot of the base problems there, but those in, in, in themselves are inherently flawed. So how can we now like shift that and how can we now make it better? And I think a big theme also um, is inclusivity and like what that looks like. Um, I don't want to go like too far derailed now, but like if we're talking yeah. like web three and like the metaverse, like for example, something that I was talking with another creator uh, was around just like inclusivity in this space. And um, you know, if people do start working in the metaverse one day, like 
uh, you know, if you're disabled, uh, let's say you're in a wheelchair or something, like no one will ever really have to know. And so, you know, if you've faced discrimination before or whatever, like the metaverse or Web3 kind of lets you right. be whoever you want to be. Uh, but I know that's kind of like random and a little bit like, no, no, no. Different from what you were saying. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to bring that point up because I think that was also really interesting. No worries. Yeah. Like let's, let's, let's move the shift, the shift topic. So let's talk about web three. I love talking about, <laughs> don't worry about tangents. I love talking about tangents. I love exploring these ideas. I think that's one of the biggest purposes of this podcast. So uh, yeah, that, that's actually something I never thought about. Like people with disabilities or like that inclusivity aspect that metaverse offers because I don't know. Like I have a lot of different thoughts about the metaverse. <laughs> Same. It's 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 a little it's confusing, right? Like you don't it is. I think there's a lot of benefits. I think there's a lot of cons. And I'm sure a lot, a lot, of, lot risks, of people have talked about sure. the cons. Risks, exactly. Uh yeah, it's it's just it's I, like what what are your thoughts on the overall on the metaverse? Uh, so honestly, when, you know, when the metaverse started blowing up and people started talking about it, like I was genuinely like scared. Like I was just right. nervous because I was like, this sounds like a huge potential red flag for like mental health or just like people prioritizing, you know, really being in the present and being in reality versus like, you know, putting all their eggs into their di digital identity, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of like, skepticism there i think as i've entered into the nft space i've be become a little bit more open-minded in a sense that like i do see more of the more of the pros and things like that coming out i think it's still like very like it's still too early to say exactly what that's going to look like or, or what's yeah. happening there but i think in general i'm excited because i feel like you know with all this talk with web3 it really is allowing more voices to be heard and so i think that again in itself has its pros and cons but right now i'm seeing a lot of the pros of that in a sense that like you know you do get to build these relationships with people you do get to have a say um right. which kind of feels refreshing you know compared to like the past where like things were kind of just given to you whereas like mm -hmm. now it's like you can help shape it right yeah that makes sense um and I, you know i actually think you know sort of thinking about that as well like one interesting thing is usually people associate the metaverse and web3 but yeah. I think there's actually a lot of fundamental differences between the two because right now most people associate the metaverse with Facebook. So yeah. Facebook's going to have a lot of control on the metaverse while a lot of Web3 is exactly opposite where it's taking control from conglomerates and trying to return it back to the individual. So it's actually really funny how people associate both of those together because really I think it's actually sort of it, it, like both technology, at least at this point, are sort of hypocritical from one each other from each other. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. I think a lot of people, including myself in the beginning, um, yeah. saw those two terms like metaverse and web three as interchangeable. But now like you start to realize that, you know, it, it really, it really isn't an inter, it's not an interchangeable word at all. Uh, and I'm yeah. still trying to learn more about like, you know, the differences and kind of what that looks like. But I 100% agree with what you said. Mm -hmm. So, so like getting into web three, like how Obviously, Web3 is a new space, and I think for me, one of the biggest challenges is just trying to understand Web3 and some of the technologies. Um, and I've gone my own way, like listening to articles and podcasts and stuff, but it's just huge. It's really hard to sort of get a grasp on. So I was just wondering, like, how did you go about uh, learning about Web3? Or how, how are you doing it right now? Maybe perhaps you're going through a learning process continually as well. Yeah, so this is actually an interesting question because uh, literally like two months ago, like if we're talking about December, when I first started to become more familiar with like, you know, the terms of Web3 and like whatnot, uh, I actually had like no interest at all in entering the space. Like it was just very mm. confusing to me. I could not conceptualize like what was going on. It was just very confusing. Um, but my significant other, he's actually like very into like emerging tech and stuff like that so this is like very random now but um for christmas i made him like this notion hub of like all these like web3 links and like resources about like how to learn more and like in doing right. that it actually got me more exposure into the space and got me more interested um so we actually do hope to one day release that hub of like resources and <laughs> things like that um right but it was literally just through like very aggressive like Google searching and like just trying to look for YouTube videos, Medium articles, and things like that. Um, right. While also trying to like be careful and watch out and be selective because you know because things are so new. Like especially when you see different articles out there, like 
everyone's opinion is different and sometimes it's a game of telephone like sometimes you don't know what like i guess fake news is versus like reality um so it can mm -hmm. be hard in that sense but for me now with you know my nft collection and stuff like that i've just been learning by taking the same approach that i've taken with my startups in the past is really just right. trying to talk to as many people as i can who have been in the space longer than me and asking them uh you know how they learned more about the space and kind of mm -hmm. where they went from there mm -hmm. yeah i'm out here thinking like what what a christmas gift <laughs> you gotta ask for like <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, like AirPods or something. <laughs> but, yeah, that, that's, that's a, that's a unique one. But no, for sure. Yeah. I think like, uh, of course, like the internet's your best resource. And it's really interesting actually to talk to people in the space. That's, that's honestly one of the reasons like I, I, I've tried getting more Web3 creators onto the podcast as well, because I'm trying to understand their perspective, what they think, uh, or how, how they how they think Web3 can affect the world and, and their work. Um, because for me, it's like really t like, even, even if I know the theoreticals behind things, like I understand blockchain and I understand a lot of these concepts now to some degree, uh, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to understand the actual practical applications of it. So it's really interesting to hear people in the space um, and, and some of their thoughts on it. So it definitely makes sense that that's sort of the approach you took on uh, of learning as well. Yeah, and I find that with like a lot of the people that I've connected with, like everyone is just so like nice like obviously sure there might be that like one-off like person who isn't the most friendly but like i feel like everyone is so nice and like excited in this space like it, i don't mm -hmm. know maybe i'm biased and like this my thoughts are very much tied to specifically like the nft subset or like space i guess but right. i feel like the vibe is so different from like you know your traditional startup where i feel like when I think of traditional startups, like the place that I would go to look for information or like connect with people is LinkedIn. But right. with NFTs or and like uh, and Web three, like I feel like Twitter is like the main space where I'll for look sure. for people and and things like that. And I feel like the conversations are more casual. People are less like formal in that sense, which is it's kind right. of a nice shift in a way because uh, I feel like you, it really brings out people's personalities more and kind of um, lets you build stronger relationships with people i guess mm, and, it, and it makes sense like linkedin is definitely more career oriented well yeah uh twitter is more casual and it's more i think i think twitter in general is just also just more of a creative space artistic space so it makes sense that nft creators and, and people in that space uh, who are supporting creators are probably going to stick to that uh, domain of course there's also also more issues with linkedin but i won't get into that in this podcast um but yeah, okay, that that's yeah, that's interesting. Um, and is there any like, is there any certain creators you 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 are really interested in that you think people should check out or? Um, so there are a bunch of different creators who I really love um, right now in this space. A lot of them are like one of one artists. So there's too mm -hmm. many to to name, so I won't like name them all now. But if anyone's sure. ever interested, like feel free to to hit me up with that. Um, but in terms of resources and things like that, um. I found Hashlips to be very, very helpful. Um, he's actually a YouTuber, mm -hmm. but he creates a lot of videos about like Web3 and kind of how to get started in that space. So I'd say definitely check him out. Um, and yeah, I guess if more come to mind, I'll keep thinking on that. But as of right now, that's sure. the first one that comes top of mind. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe throw a link in the show notes. Uh, so if somebody wants to check him out, uh, they can do that. But yeah, I think this is a really great conversation. So wrapping up, uh, what like i know you're excited about nfts in web3 but is there any other technology in web3 that really excites you um so i have been trying to think about like different applications in the space and sort of what that looks like there are a few mm -hmm. ideas that um uh, you know myself and my co-founder at lumaki labs kind of have brewing uh so that might come out maybe sometime like maybe this year maybe not um uh, but i have been thinking a lot about that or even just technology that would assist with the creation of nfts in general um right. but yeah that's all i'll say for now <laughs> okay yeah no worries hopefully we can have you back on the podcast when you fi finalize those ideas and talk about them uh but i guess you know, so I know you sort of touched on this right now, but uh, in general, what are your next steps and what's next? Yeah, that's a good question. So I guess for me, the, the biggest next steps are really just finalizing the mint date and finalizing some of the smart contracts for my NFT collection and then hopefully beginning to, to mint them in March. Mm -hmm. Cool, perfect. Well, really looking forward to that. I'll leave a link to uh, 
your NFT collection and, and some of your work uh, in the show notes so everyone can check it out. But it's really great having you on the podcast, Mylene. I really enjoyed talking with you. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can see you soon again on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. You too. Bye.